Turn with me, please, to John's Gospel, chapter 6. John's Gospel, chapter 6. And will you let your eye run down to verse 53? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. For in you whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Just for time's sake, let your eye run down the chapter, please. Verse 60. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What, and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? But it is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Let your eye run down again, if you will, just for time's sake, to verse 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. For he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Let us pray. Father, this morning we thank you for everyone that you've brought, for the children who are way out to their children's church this morning, and the leaders, the teachers, for the crash that's opened. We pray your blessing on all of them there, Father. And now we ask you, Father, that you would shut us in with yourself this morning. May this morning be a place where, Lord, you speak to our hearts and teach us. Teach us your word, Lord Jesus, and show us the glories of Christ and the wonders of our God. And help us, Lord, to be firm in the foundation of our faith in Christ alone. Glorify his name among us, Lord. We think. Lord, of, of those who can't be with us this morning for illness, that you would bless them. We do pray again for June's mommy, Lord, today. We ask you, Lord, that you'd encourage her and the family there, Lord, in the hospital. Father, we do pray for Rebecca today. And Lord, that you would re remember her, Lord, and look her way and bless her family. And Lord, there are so many others. We think of Ernie and Grace this morning. Lord, that you would raise them up out of a sick bed and bless them and encourage them. And God, that you would just move upon each and every one of us. Father, we love you and we worship you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord Jesus starts giving the disciples or those who say they are, they are following him, starts laying down hard things. In other words, he starts laying on heavy truths of the word, starts to bring to them deeper revelation of God and of himself especially. And it's sort of, you see here, at what we would call, it sorts out the wheat from the chaff. Uh, we would have the saying, it sorts out the men from the boys and maybe the women from the girls even. Because many of them cannot stick what he is saying. And in a sense, there is a way, and we'll look at it in a moment, you can't really blame them because they're looking at a religious attitude that has been birthed in them by religious men. 
For example, in our reading this morning, the Lord Jesus said in verse 53, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. In other words, it seems as as if the Lord Jesus is saying, if someone doesn't eat my flesh literally, drink my blood literally, then you have no eternal life. That's what people take from this. And the Church of Rome take this and have the transubstantiation from this, where they hold up the little uh, flour and water wafer and they do what is known as the hocus pocus, is where it comes from where they change the wafer into the literal body, blood, sinew and divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And and hence the adherents who come along, the communicants, when they take it, they believe they're taking in Jesus to have eternal life. Seems like they would be right. Until, if you would let your eye run down to verse 63, because they can't understand this, they they start walking away and in verse 63, the Lord Jesus said, it is the spirit that quickeneth. Notice the flesh profiteth nothing. Now take note, the words I speak unto you, that which he's just said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit. They are life. In other words, it's not literal. I'm talking in a spiritual manner. Just like a parable is a spiritual manner story to throw down and lay alongside of something to make a a, a heavenly purpose or story out of it, a, a truth to come out of it. It's not literal. If it be literal, in the same chapter, the Lord Jesus said in verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Is he literally bread? Is he literally a loaf of bread? When he breaks bread and gives in the upper room to the disciples, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you as he breaks the bread. He's saying, this is what they'll do to me. They will break my body as it were when he is crucified and the bread is broken. But his body is here literally. The bread is here literally. So he can't be either or. He has to be either or. He can't be both at that same time. He's saying, this is what you do. This is a remembrance of me. The Lord Jesus tells us in John 15, I am the true vine and my father is a husbandman. Are we saying that Jesus is literally the vine from whence the grape or the wine to drink comes from? Is he a literal vine? And the answer is absolutely not. Is he the literal bread then? Absolutely not. He is the bread that came down from heaven. Did he literally come down from heaven? Yes, but he's not literally bread. And hence, when we break bread, it is a remembrance. It is a remembrance that Christ died for us. His body was broken. His blood was shed. And when we partake of these, we are reminding ourselves as we gather around the table of these great truths. And so hence, when the Lord Jesus starts saying to them, he says, listen, my bread, or that bread's my body. Or here he's saying, no, you have to eat my flesh. That wine, that cup is my blood. You have to drink of this in the spirit. The words that I speak unto you or say unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And hence we know that it isn't literally, but spiritual. But we remember Christ. In verse 60 of the chapter, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, had said, this is a hard saying. Notice, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? The word hard there is offensive. Jesus, you're offending us. It means intolerable. This, we can't tolerate what you're coming off with here. Some people are like that with the preacher. Some people are like that with the pastor. Some people are like that, whether it be uh, out in the street preaching. This is intolerable. 
out witnessing. You're intolerable. Even those who say they're Christians, or whether they be, uh, have a center of witness at Craig Alvin Roundabout on a Tuesday night for, uh, uh, for abolishing abortion there, and, or whether it be somewhere else. You are intolerable, they say, but yet they don't see the, the, the spirit behind it. I want to talk about more about these things this evening, about the spirit of the age. I don't want to go too far into that this morning. But here, even those who it says are disciples, so-called disciplined followers of Christ, uh, they, they eat the literal bread and they take from the face that he breaks and they hear the words that he teaches and all that he says and he, he speaks like no other man has ever spoken. But when it comes to this, he said, this is in hard saying, who can hear it? Or this is offensive, this is harsh, this is intolerable. And see you preacher, see you group down there, you're just intolerable. Verse 61 says, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you. See the word offend is the word scandalizo. Where we get scandal from? Scandalizo, and it means what Jesus is saying, does this trip you up? Does this cause you to stumble? Does the hard words of the gospel, the deeper truths of the word, the things that are laid on you that are past the milk, the milk period and, and going on to meat, does it cause you to stumble. Does it trip you up? That's the idea of this word here. And Jesus is saying to those who are there, does this make you stumble? Does it, am I tripping you up here? You see, brothers and sisters, when God brings us to a place where he lays heavier words on us, when he lays deeper truths on us, when he brings us to a place where we've never really heard or been or seen before and we have to be, you know, we're contending with the things that he's saying because we have to nearly be broken down that we might be built up again. But some turn away, some run away, some are scandalized in the sense they're tripped up and they stumble and they don't want to hear what the word says to them, but they want to hear what they want to hear. And the master is saying to them, because I said you eat my flesh and drink my blood, are you not getting the spirit of it? You can only see the carnality, the 2020 vision of it. And that's what's wrong. You see, many people who claim Christ can only see the 2020 vision of things. But they don't see the whole spirit behind things. They don't see that spirit of the age. They don't see the spirit behind what is going on. They don't see the spirit behind the word, as it were, carrying the word of God to the hearts of men and women. And the Lord Jesus says, am I tripping you up? Would I cause you to stumble? Now, I want you to take note of this because he's saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood and ye shall have eternal life. Now, I want you to see if you go with me to Luke 17, or pardon me, Leviticus 17. Leviticus 17. And go, if you will, to verse 10. Listen to what the word of the Lord said. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers, those who are not of the house of Israel, people from other around about lands, that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood. And will cut him off from among his people. Verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar. To make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel. No soul of you shall eat blood. Neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. Now the Lord Jesus is saying. I'm going to bring you not deeper into the word as it were, but into the spirit. Because according to the word, and Jesus is telling them to eat his blood or drink his blood and to eat his flesh, 
And Jesus, according to this, listen, if it is literal, I have to put that across. If it is literal flesh, if it is his literal blood, if it is transubstantiated from a wafer, if it is to do with that, then we are breaking the law of God. And Jesus, if it be literal, is breaking the law of his father. And if Jesus is breaking the law of his father, then you and I are not saved. If it be, if it be, then you and I are not saved. But Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit. And they are life. So he's talking about the spirit of it. Why we have the remembrance of the breaking of bread. And hence the disciples are saying, we've had enough. This is a hard saying. We are offended at your words. And when you look at it with 2020 vision, when you look at it from a religious point of view, when you look at it from whatever point of view you look at it, whatever religion, whatever denomination you come from, and you look at it with eyes that are in the scripture, you say, but they're right, and Jesus is wrong then. If it be literal. If it be literal. And that's the most important thing to hang this on. Because if it's literal, we're all lost and in our sin. Because Christ has broken the law and Christ then is a sinner too. But he said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. It's not literal blood. It's not literal flesh. And hence, that's why he asked them, Doth this offend you in verse 61? Are you scandalized? Are you scandalized by this? Are you offended? Does it trip you up? Does it cause you to stumble? So it's not literal. Christ has kept the law of his father to the T, the law that you and I couldn't keep. So when we get down to verse 68, Let's go to verse 67 even. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? So whenever these things get tough, when the Lord lays on you, brother, and on you, sister, when he lays on you his word, whether it's through your own private reading or whether it's through the preaching of the word, or whatever way it comes through the word of God to you, when the Lord lays on you the word of God for your life, for your life, and you don't like that part, or you find it too hard, too difficult, maybe the Lord would tell you to do something, to go somewhere, to be something, to give up something, Maybe the Lord will teach you something about his word that you thought always in your head was right. But the Lord's word shows you wrong. But because you've grew up in a certain denomination or you've grew up whatever way among whatever Christian home you came from or you didn't grow up with anything at all like me. And the word is laid on you that your life must change because of this. What about the Lord says to you, this is the Sabbath day. This is the, the Christian Sabbath, as you'd say. This is the Lord's day. This is not a holy, this is a holy day, not a holy day. This is a day to keep sacred for me, not a day for working, not a day for enjoyment even. It's a day where you meet unto me as an assembly. And people go, oh, but after church, I wanted to go and I was going go to go to do whatever, X, Y, Z. The Lord says, no. Lord, this is too much for me. That's... Brothers and sisters, God's word remains true at all times. And when God brings you, sometimes if you want to grow in God, if you want to grow in Christ, 
if you want to go deeper in him, then you need to yield. So do I. We all do. We need to yield to what the Lord, the Holy Spirit, is showing us and giving us in his word. Whatever it is. I told you years ago, 24 years ago, I was walking over a park in Belfast praying. I'll do anything, Lord. Big me. Big, the big I am, the big me. I'll do anything, Lord. I'll go anywhere. You just send me, Lord, and I'm here to go. I wanted them to say, there's a nice wee cushy number. I'll fit you in there. Thanks, Lord. And I'm going to do that with a heart and a half. But, Lord, I'll do anything. And the Lord told me, well, give everything that you own away. Give everything that you own away. Do not sell it. Give it away. And go to Romania to serve me. Lord, I'll go, oh, Lord, Romania, really? You want me to do all that? Seriously? Ah, challenge, you see. Will you also go away, Ken? I was afraid to go home to tell Alison. Not because she's so bad, I just didn't want her. Because was, we weren't long married. We were about a year and a half married. And when I was walking down, I says, Lord, would you tell Alison before I get there? So as I can break this word here, how am I meant to say this? She's just set her house up. It's all been read, all done. It's all, it was actually renovated, brand new. Everything was sitting in a brand spanking new. Everything was new, like a new pin. And there she was, just married in her, making her wee nest, you know. And when I got down into the house, there she was at the kitchen. And it was a long kitchen. And her back was to the door. And I seen her like this. I go, what's wrong with her? I said, you all right? She turned around, and Alison's not a crier, if you get to know her. And she was, she was bawling her eyes out, face soaking with tears. I, says, what's, I thought somebody had died. I said, Alison, what's wrong? What's wrong? She couldn't speak. And I go, well, come on, we'll get sitting down, you know. And as we're walking out, there was a wee blue King James Bible her brother and grandfather preacher had bought her sitting on a table. And she went, on the, on the dining room table. And we went over and I sat down beside her. And she settled down. I says, what's wrong? She says, Ken, I, I was reading and I seen the Lord in Gethsemane and he fell on his face. It was like I seen him. It was like I was there. I seen him. Something happened. I seen him. And I said, Lord, why did you do that? She says, and I heard this voice saying, for you. I done this for you. I said, well, Alison, the Lord talked to me and told me, we have to give everything away. We have not to sell it. Give it away and go to Romania. She says, well, that's what he's told me afterwards. I know. What is it that God lays on you that you struggle to give over? Because God is no man's debtor. And so when we went, was it all, was it all wonderful, you know, hearts and flowers and, you know, see when you see the missionaries and see all the pictures of the missionaries and all the wee children there, wherever they are, and ours were the same, you know, all these Romanians and we're in the, in the, the home, we're in the orphanage, we're trying to get kids out of the, the old orphanages and into a big home that was built there. And, you know, we, everything looks wonderful because you're doing a good work, but that's only the surface. See behind it, in every missionary endeavor, there's muck, there's dirt, there's, there's danger. And all of it, it looks all great. And you walk there, you know, you're not wafting up and down the streets everywhere. The children are following you like the Pied Piper and you're, you bring them into the home. We were in there and Alison and I were going to get done in them, one of the homes by a group of the older kids. So loads of them gathered around us. And only one said, you, you, uh, you born again Christian? I says, yes. And he seemed to be the leader and he went, leave them alone. What were their knives in all their pockets? Big knives. 
tell you a million stories. All the muck and dirt's behind it. And, and so it wasn't like the Lord told me to give this over so everything was brilliant. Everything was hectic, terrible and hard. But the blessing was to see what God was doing in it. And when we came home, it was still as hard. But nevertheless, the hard things, it's not offensive, but it's, it's nearly offensive to the, the hearer because you're saying, Lord, you really want me to do this? Honestly, you want me to do this? And the Lord wouldn't let on you if he didn't want you to. And what people say then, if I run away far enough from God, you see, they, they, they turn out like Jonah. Gets on a ship to go to Tarsus. You see, and in Jonah's day, although Jonah should have knew better, the whole Mediterranean area right through to uh, the Pillars of Hercules, which is the Straits of Gibraltar known as today, uh, he thought, if I get outside of those because they believed that God's jurisdiction was only in the Mediterranean area, and once you get outside into the big open sea of the Atlantic, as it's known now, they, knew, they thought, well, once you're out there, God has no jurisdiction over you. So Jonah gets into a ship to go to Tarsus, outside of the pillars of Hercules or the Straits of Gibraltar. And when he gets outside of there, he gets outside there, he's going to be free. But of course, the Lord caught hold of him. We know the story about the great fish swallowing him up and spewing him back on the beach. Maybe the Lord's telling you, look, a sin, something that's gripped you, give it up. The Lord's saying, give it to me. I want to bring you further. I want to take you deeper. And many, many Christians have 2020 vision. It's just what we see with our eyes, as it were. And we read and we, we don't see the whole spirit of things. We don't see the bigger picture, as it were. And we can't see what's behind everything. God has a greater plan and purpose. God has a, is it always going to be easy? Never did I say it was ever going to be easy. Jesus never said that it was going to be easy to be a Christian, but he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you in it. Maybe you're one of those who used to be fervent for the Lord and you fell away. You're going on with God, sort of, but there's no fervency anymore. Maybe you're one of those who, one of those Christians who, well, you see it and you say, well, if I, if I, if I just show my face, that keeps me right with God. If I just show my face, it'll keep me right with God. Or maybe you were one of those Christians, you were, as it were, uh, pardon the phrase, to eat the altar rails, you were never out of a church meeting because you were always at the church meeting. Sunday morning we're here, Sunday night, and something else is taking you out of the road. And, and the thing is, the Lord said, but that's not where I placed you. I put you here. But Lord, I, 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 I want to do this or I want to go there. It's easy for me, Lord, because, and I can make me excuse why a uh, Sunday after dinner and, you know, get my dinner and I put my feet up and I fall asleep. Who likes to have a sleep on a Sunday afternoon? I, I get a wee doze for 10 minutes sometimes and then I'm into my study. Don't you get your dinner and you're, you're going, I usually, put, I usually put Jimmy Swaggart on. And his church is live and they're playing all the music ready for them preaching. And I don't see them preaching. I hear them playing the music and I wake up and it's nearly over. What happened there? Brothers and sisters, whatever it is, it might be hard. And you can leave here today and go out the doors, into your car and go home and, yes, Lord, that's it. I'm determined from this day. But sure, as soon as you get home, you get your dinner, you forget all about it. The Lord says to them, I'm laying heavier stuff on you. I'm bringing you into deeper waters here. And see, whenever you ask the Lord, yeah, take me into deeper waters. It's great, isn't it? When he does. But the deeper the water, the greater the danger too. Because the enemy won't like it. The devil will hate it. 
But you know, whenever the Lord brings in the deeper waters, just like Simon Peter, as we spoke about him getting out of that boat, the Lord can cause you to walk on what your enemy will sink in. The Lord can cause you to walk on what your enemy will sink in. Does this trip you up this morning? Am I saying words that have caused you to stumble? That's what it means. Doth this offend you, Jesus says in verse 61. Am I, am I an offense to you? What I'm saying, is it too much for you? Am I too deep here? Am I too, you know? And so the Lord says, it says in verse 66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then Jesus, then said Jesus unto the twelve, we also go away. Are you going to run and hide? You want to stop walking with me just because of hard words? Verse 68, then Simon Peter answering, answered him. Notice Simon says, this is Simon says part five. Simon says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. See, no matter what the cost is, brothers and sisters, no matter what the cost is, Jesus is worth it. He's worth it. And Simon says, Lord, to whom? Notice, to whom shall we go? And I, I find that so many Christians are so quickly to run to the world, worldliness, worldly things, to do them because their flesh demands it, uh, rather than to run to Christ and, and be safe. that Christians are so easy, many Christians are so easy to say, well, it's too hard. I'm stumbling. I'm tripping over this. It's offensive. This Christian life is too much. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, I know the Christian life can be a difficult life and a hard life, especially the days in which we're living. And I understand that with all my heart because I get flack. I was talking to someone just a few moments before we started. I get flack week in, week out. Week in and week out. So I understand that. Brothers and sisters, see at the end of the day, I was where they are. I want them to be where I am. Saved. And the world has no attraction for me. The world has no hold over me. Send this in the grace of God. The world has no grip on me. Even if it's just to go out, what people say, I'm only going out to sit in the bar for a wee drink. Yeah, you go and sit with the devil then. Fellowship with him and tell me how good it is. Told you, big fella, well known paramilitary, brought him to church years ago, 25 years ago, maybe. He got saved, he made a professional self. He was doing really well, really well. Every time he went to his flat, he lived in the block of flats we lived in, or I lived in, then Alison came to live with us, with me. And he lived in this block of flats, and you know, he had the security doors on because he was a, a a, a, a target, you know, and, and all of this sort of stuff. And he gets saved. And all you heard from his, his flat was worship music. It's all you could hear. He'd, he'd given up the drink and he wasn't on the drugs. And he'd, you know, all of this sort of stuff. And I went to him. 
one day and I says, well, how'd you get on? I missed you a couple of days there. And his head was in his hands because his heart was in his boots. He says, I, I went to the, he mentioned the bar, I'm not mentioning, it's not there anymore, but just in case anyone would know him. I went to the bar and I thought I'll go in here and I'll tell these things about the Lord. And he sat with them while they drank their beer or whatever they were drinking. He thought, I'll just have a Coke. And then as time went on and the, you know, the good old laughing memories, you forget about the bad times, just remember the good times. Next it came to a shandy he took and then it went to the beer. And he's sitting drinking a few beers. One of these men said to him, if this Jesus whom you are speaking about to us is so good, then you tell us, why are you sitting here with this today, drinking? I'll tell you whether or not, they said to him, you're not, go- you're not going back to church, they told him. You're back in with us. They let him go. And I had to go down and try and help him get back out again. And he done it again. And when he done it again, there was no letting go of him. He's in. He's not going out. He stood with, he had a, a, a paperwork of all the crimes that he was up for and had committed over the years. And he stood, he was taller than me. And he stood like this with a load of paper and he held the top of it and he let it go and it didn't unravel by the time it hit the floor. Stand with it like this. And the man has had about three or four failed suicide attempts ever since. Can't live with himself. Can't live with himself. So please, don't tell me the world's that good only went once. There's a man and he played in a worship band very gifted musically. I mean, this guy could lift instruments and play. And he went to a friend from another church to his house who brought him into his garage. And there were flagons all around the walls. And this man said, what are those around the walls? He says, this man grew up in church, never took a drink in his life. And the guy says, we make homemade wine. And he said, you make homemade wine, you're a Christian. You're drinking this. He says, taste it, it's, it's nice. He says, no, you're all right. Never took a drink in my life. Taste it, he says, taste it. And he prevailed on him and he says, well, sure, I'll take a wee sip just to taste it. And he ended up a chronic alcoholic. One, once. He ended up a chronic alcoholic. And guess what happened? We tried to get him a house. We got him furniture and he lost all of that. There was another try on him again. He lost that and he eventually disappeared. We couldn't find out where he was. You know what happened to him? He fell down the stairs and broke his neck. Stone dead. And that's how he went into the presence of Christ. Boy, pastor's talking hard things today. Who can hear it? This is tripping me up a bit. This is making me stumble. Jesus says, will you also go away? And Peter, who said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? I tell you something, brothers and sisters, I have, I thought I'll do this short this morning, just write a few things down. I have three pages there. And I haven't touched the first line yet. I haven't touched the first line yet. Notice here, 
verse 68, then Simon Peter, so Simon says, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. See, never man spake like this man. Jesus is the fullness of the revelation of God. The word that was with the Father made flesh tabernacling among us. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the A to Z, if you want to, of all of God's word. Great eternal spirit resides in a man of flesh and blood. Son of God, son of man. He is the bread of life which came down from heaven spiritually. He is the true vine in which we take of the cup spiritually. He's not a literal vine and literal bread. He's not literal wine and literal bread. He's, he's speaking in the spirit. And if you can get it, the spirit of it this morning, if you can get it in your spirit, into your mind this morning, that Christ lays on us these things that Christ lays on us the things that he says, is this offensive to you, Ken? I'll tell you this and I'm going to stop. I'll maybe do that next week. I don't know. I've, I've another one already written as well. I wrote it this week. I've just been seeing it and just... You know... I think of the times in my life when the Lord has laid heavy things on me, challenged me doctrinally, continually, still does, continually, but laid heavy things upon me. And sometimes it's easy to think I can run away, like Jonah. And if I run long enough, God will forget it and will not remind me of it. No. Jonah's in the midst of the Mediterranean Sea. And the word says, and God prepared a great fish, a whale if you want. God prepared, you know what that tells me? See that great fish? From it was born, God had ordained it, grew it, had it to a size that he needed it to swallow Jonah. Think about it. To swallow Jonah. Of course, it swallows him. He goes to the depths, as it were, the sea, spits him out onto the, onto the shore, and he goes to uh, Nineveh to preach unto them to tell them to repent and the reason Jonah didn't want to do that by the way is because Nineveh and the Assyrians were the enemies of the house of Israel and he knew that they were going to come and take them away captive and he was thought I'll stop God's word I'd stop the enemy at the same time God will understand that the ends justify the means and that's what happens to many people they think the ends will justify the means and do you know where that saying comes from the Jesuits Ignatius Loyola and the Jesuits, that they could do anything that God would turn a blind eye and the ends justifies the means. And Christians do it today. I can do this and that and that and the end justifies the means. We'll stop with this. Verse 69. Notice what he says. Peter is answering seemingly for all of them. Is it because he probably had their ear in the group? Is it because he understood what Jesus was saying and they'd be all right with it? But he says this, and we believe 
and are sure. So here's the thing, brothers and sisters. Do you believe and are you sure? Are you sure of him? Because if you believe and you're sure, then even if it's hard and if it words that nearly seems to offend, scandalize, harsh and intolerable to you, you'll learn to yield. And we, we're sure. I feel this morning that I'm speaking to a heart or if not hearts, the Lord is speaking to those who maybe have come in from maybe letting the Lord down. And now we all let the Lord down, but maybe in a, a certain way. Well, what do you do this morning? Simple. Yield. Repent. Get up and go on with the Lord. Go on with him. We believe and are sure that thou art not the Christ, but that Christ. Would you say that Christ? Because Christ is Messiah, anointed one. We believe you're that anointed one. Not just anybody who's anointed of God, but the one who came from glory, the Messiah. You're the Christ, the one the prophet spoke of. The one that Moses said would come. The one that Andrew read from Isaiah 53 around the table. We believe you're him. I believe he's him. We're sure that thou art that Christ, the Son, capital S. Notice, capital S. The one and only unique Son of the living God. May God bless the word to our hearts this morning. Maybe God will challenge us today. Maybe God has spoken and he said, you know, I've placed you here. Be here. Maybe he said, I've told you to go. Go do. And maybe someone's not saved this morning and he's saying, I'm speaking to you. You're not ready and you're not right with me. You must be born again. Then we're here to help you with these things. May God bless you. Team, would you come up, please? Amen.